Welcome to Christina's Kitchen. I'm Christina McPeters, and this is Christina's Kitchen. Unfortunately, we don't have a live audience today, but I'm so glad you can join us online as we seek to explore cooking basics and what I call 202. I know that's not really the way it goes, but last uh, month we did Cooking Basics 101, and uh, this time it's part two. So, um, how are we doing, Daniel? Are we ready? We're ready to go. Well, I'm going to ask Pastor Daniel to come over here and have an opening prayer for us. All right. Well, so glad that we can have this class again. I'm sorry that we can't be meeting in person, and but hey, online is better than nothing, right? And we can do some fun stuff online too. So, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your blessings towards us. Thank you for this opportunity to have this class. I pray that you will uh, be with us this evening and be with each one who is listening online. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, my audience today is Daniel and uh, Macy, who is helping us run the cameras, and Lexi, who is monitoring the comments. So if you want to join us and say a comment or ask a question, uh, we will try to get that in during our class as well. So feel free to interact and join us as well. Uh, last month, when we did Cooking Basics 101, oh, and I should say, my mother is here too. She's just in the kitchen, so you'll probably see her too. Anyway, last month when we did Cooking Basics 101, we started with uh, some th simple things like how to pick out produce out of the grocery store, uh, how to wash lettuce, um, and make it taste amazing, uh, how to store produce in the fridge, um, how to pick out good cooking pots, um, and uh, some of your cooking gadgets, uh, cutting. How Daniel taught us how to sharpen knives. Um, and uh, so I think that's about where we ended last month because then we ran out of time. And there's so much more I want to share with you. So we're going to dive right in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to set up your kitchen, and then uh, once we have got the kitchen set up, uh, we're going to talk about some more on produce, and then what I promised you last month, and that is substitutions. So I don't know which camera I'm supposed to be looking at. So I'm looking at this one over here now? Okay. I've got two cameras aimed at me, and I never know which one to look at. So um, when setting up your kitchen, uh, we talked about some of the little gadgets that you can use. There are some appliances that you need in order to have a kitchen. Now you don't have to have the biggest and best, and you certainly do not have to have all of them, but I wanted to just share briefly with you some of the kitchen gadgets that are out there um, and some of my favorites. So the first one, and one that if you want to cook plant-based and healthy, is pretty much a 100% essential item, and that is a blender. Uh, the, a good blender, not a, one of those little bitty magic bullets that does a smoothie, but an actual blender um, is one of your absolute must if you want to make your cheese sauce and salad dressings um, and uh, puddings and a lot of these things from scratch that we normally would just buy at a bottle from the grocery store. My personal preference is a Vitamix, and yes, I know they are spendy, um, but uh, that is like what you say, the, the top of the line model. There are other really good blenders out there too. I know Blintec makes one and there's a few others, uh, but if you cannot afford one, it's okay. Uh, you can get yourself an um, uh, Oster blender from Walmart, and the one thing that you will, that I will say, uh, when Daniel and I got married, that's what we used and I had to buy a new one every couple of years because I burned up the motor. <laughs> so they do eventually start adding up. But uh, I just had to make smaller recipes, which is fine when it was just two of us anyway. Um, and I had to let it blend longer. But you can get really nice creamy sauces with a small uh, Walmart Oyster blender. So uh, start there, and then if you find you're using your blender a lot, start saving up for something nice. So this is a Vitamix here. Uh, that's what uh, my favorite one is, and but uh, Daniel and I have been married for almost five years before we got our first Vitamix, so, um, and I've cooked this way for many, many years. So, um, My second 
favorite personal appliance is the Instant Pot. I know it's one of those things that like everybody's talking about nowadays and it's really super popular. Um, but uh, the Instant Pot, that's this one right over here, um, is a great tool when you want to get rid of your crock pot. You can get rid of your rice cooker. Uh, you can get rid of your pressure cooker, not your canner, but your pressure cooker is on the stove. Um, you can get rid of a lot of those other appliances and do it all in one with the Instant Pot. Uh, the Instant Pot is, uh, it can work as a crock pot. It is a pressure cooker, it is not a pressure canner. Don't get confused with that. It's a pressure cooker. Um, it also uh, does, you can use it as a pot, like if you don't have a stove or any other pots, um, or if you're traveling, you can take it with you. And uh, you can saute. It has a super high heat function to saute vegetables at the bottom. Uh, it also uh, has, uh, like I said, a slow cook feature, and it is a yogurt maker. Um, I like the fact it has a stainless steel metal insert, uh, so it's easy to clean and it doesn't burn. And with a delay start, you can put stuff in it, go to bed, and maybe you have fresh food in the morning. Or you can start it in the morning, go to work, and you got dinner ready when you get home. So uh, the Instant Pot, like I said, uh, when I got it, I quit using my crock pot and my um, rice cooker and everything else, and that's all I use now. <laughs> um, another one of my favorites is the griddle. Sorry, I'm moving over here on you, Macy. Uh, the griddle. Uh, this is actually a ceramic non-stick griddle, so you don't have to use oil when you're cooking. Uh, and uh, I love it because I can do pancakes on it. Uh, it's great for hash browns. It's good for waffles. Not waffles. Zucchini. I'm tired. Pancakes is what I meant. And uh, burgers and zucchini patties. Uh, so we get a lot of use out of the griddle. Uh, we use them here at the restaurant, and so uh, we wear them on a regular basis too. Um, and then the optional ones, and I say optional because I don't have either of these at home. <laughs> uh, optional is a food processor. I don't own one at home. I do use one here at the restaurant, and I'm very thankful for it because um, it does save time, if you're, especially if you're making a lot of big batches. Um, it's nice for things like energy bites or um, gluten-free pie crust. Uh, it's great for, it's got slicing blades, so it's great for like making slicing vegetables for soups um, or for um, uh, coleslaw or things like that. Uh, it works very quickly for it. Also is great for big batches of pesto, so you don't have to use your blender, um, as well as like falafels and chick salad sandwich spread and a lot of other things we make here at the restaurant. It's great in a food processor. but. Um, it's one of those things that I would consider non-essential and something that if you're going to do a serious amount of cooking for a lot of people, then it's a worthwhile investment. Um, and then the last one I have here is the air fryer. And this is also one that I consider non-essential. Um, I have actually only recently got one. It's nice for small groups, but not for large families or large groups of people because it does a small amount of food. Um, but it is a great way to roast vegetables without heating up the whole oven and heating up the whole house in the summertime. Um, so it is nice for that. Um, I'm supposed to look at this one now, okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, they also make an air fryer attachment for the instant pot. It's a lid that just sits on the pot. And uh, that is really nice for really tiny batches. Um, and uh, small one one person meals or two people meals um, i have recently gotten one of those for my house um, and i like that for it's just daniel and i and it's not another full contraption like this one is here uh, it's just a lid that goes on top of the instant pot and fits on a shelf in my kitchen but those are like i say the the non-essentials those are just fun little things to have um, unless of course you want to eat real vegetables every day and uh, don't have the ability to heat up your whole house using the oven all the time, then it's a great essential tool. So uh, you be the judge on that, but that's just um, some of our top favorite appliances. Um, what I don't have out here, of course, is the waffle iron. If you want waffles, that is another appliance. But um, anyway, that's just a few things to set up your kitchen.
My top favorite two are these right here. If I only had to choose two appliances and live the rest of my life, this is what I would have right here. So I want to go on um, and talk a little bit about fruit. Last time I showed you how to wash lettuce and wash vegetables. Um, I want to talk a little about how to wash fruit because oftentimes when we get fruit like apples or grapes or oranges, grapefruit, uh, some of those fruits, uh, we find that there is a wax coating on them. Uh, and uh, that coating is really hard to get off. Or maybe it is just um, you want to strip off pesticides or you want to make sure to kill bacteria. Um, what I like to do when I'm washing fruit is I put my fruit, however much fruit I'm going to wash, in my sink or dish pan or whatever. And uh, we're going to put some water in here. Can you see what I'm doing inside here? You're welcome to come closer if you need to. We do not have professional cameras. These are just little cell phones. But we just do our best with what we got. Uh, and hopefully you can see. Okay, so we have water in here. I've got my fruit in here. And I'm going to put some vinegar um, in there. And uh, what that vinegar does, I think this is a brand new bottle, what do you know? Uh, what the vinegar does is it actually strips off any wax, if there is wax on the fruit, it will strip it. Um, it also helps with um, uh, killing bacteria. Um, and it helps uh, strip off some of those pesticides as well, if there was any, if you don't have organic fruit. So, I, once I put the vinegar in, I let it soak for about two minutes or so, and then we will wash it off and take the apples out. So while those are soaking, I'm gonna move this out of my way. What's that? You have a timer set for two minutes? Well, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any questions yet. Well, that's good. We have 25 viewers. Though. All right. Well, hello to all the viewers. Say, Say hi, hi to us. Tell us who you are. <laughs> Tell us Ask who you questions. are. Ask questions. Whatever. I get bored just talking to myself. <laughs> so um, feel free to ask questions. All right. Um, Daniel, are you able to come over here? Uh, you've got your name written on my list here. All right. I, I forgot what my name was written there for. So. You wrote it. <laughs> You said you wanted to teach us how to calibrate the oven. Oh yeah. Well, you right might there. you might have to help me because I I know the theory of it, but you know the practice the practice of it. But every oven comes. Uh, with, of course, you have the whether it's digital or the analog. All the new ones are digital. You can set it for 350 degrees, and in theory, it warms up to 350 degrees. Exactly. But in practice, it doesn't. Every oven's a little bit different, and of course. Some ovens will have colder and hotter spots, and the thermometer, the thermostat in that oven is going to be in a little different spot. So it might heat up that thermostat to 350 degrees, but the actual part where you put your bread or your cookies might be 300, or it might be 375. And so you get a little gizmo like this and set in your oven where you're going to put your bread or your cookies. Um, and if you got a new oven, um, I don't know, it might not hurt just to turn it on and actually do this without your cookies in there because you might ru ruin a few batches of <laughs> baked goods before uh, before you do that. But anyway, warm it up to say 350 and see if the thermometer actually gets to 350. If it gets to 325, you know you're about 25 degrees too cold. So whenever your recipe says 325, uh, 350, you know, okay, I gotta set my oven for 375 in order for it to get to 350. Or if it's hot, vice versa. So you just you mark down, you have to compensate by X many degrees. Uh, or if you have a newer oven, like I just got a new oven here at the restaurant because um, our old oven broke. And so the first thing I did was I tested it and discovered that my oven was about 20 degrees off. Um, but there is on some uh, ovens a calibrate feature where you can just punch in the settings and you can calibrate it 20 degrees lower or higher. And 
uh, and you don't have to do the compensation you don't have every to do time. Compensation <laughs> in your head. The oven is calibrated, and so now when I put it at 350 and I open it up, it's actually 350. Yeah. Um, or you want to do that, or should I do it? You do. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me. Well, you start the measuring cups, and right. I'll, I'll. You can interrupt me. Interrupt you. It's been two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. You can just interrupt me from there if you want. Okay, so our apples have been sitting in our vinegar for two minutes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... You just stick this in water. What do you know? Okay, yeah. This this finger is bandaged on purpose um, because uh, I uh, was holding a glass jar. It was not a knife, I promise. I was holding Allie, a glass... Uh, Allie Thompson said vinegar for cleaning all fruit or just those with thicker skins. Uh, That's a good question. Like usually if it's the stuff with thin skins, I try to get locally, so I don't have to worry about it. But I would say stuff with thicker skins, like apples, bananas, oranges, grapefruit, grapes, and stuff like that, um, is probably going to be better than say um, peaches and strawberries. Well, actually, you can wash strawberries in vinegar, um, but I would only do that if it's store-bought strawberries. I wouldn't do that from fresh-picked, homegrown strawberries because they're really soft. Um, but anything that's fairly firm, you can do that. Um, another thing when you wash it with vinegar, it actually keeps longer. So um, I'm going to rinse this off here. And I wanted to say about my finger, in case you're wondering why the bandage, um, I dropped a glass jar and it shattered and busted my finger open. So um, my mom has very kindly bandaged it up for me, and uh, that's why the bandage on it. So we're just going to rinse these apples off. And if I can just manage to keep the bandage out of the water, we'll be doing good. All right, there is our super squeaky clean apples. Ready to go. Um, I have noticed that when I do this with grapes, especially, uh, that the grapes taste a lot better um, when you soak them in vinegar and rinse them off well versus if you just washed them in water or put a little soap on them. Um, it's amazing the flavor difference. Uh, just like we noticed a flavor difference in the lettuce um, last month, uh, there's definitely a flavor difference in your fruit as well. So I'm going to move my sink. Can I put my sink here or will it be in the way of your tripod? You better wear it. Okay. Just get it out of my way. Okay. So we've talked about calibrating your oven. We've talked about washing fruit. Um, let's talk about uh, measurements. Now, I wanted to talk about a few things, and then I'll let Daniel and you can come over here. Um, when you are dealing with measuring cups and you're setting up your kitchen, you will find something very interesting. And that is not just cups, but also spoons. Measuring cups and measuring spoons are not all alike. And uh, this may have a direct implication on how your recipe turns out. So I want to show you some of the differences here. Um, this measuring cup holds two cups. This one also holds two cups. But if I fill this up two cups and dump it in, it's not going to be the same level as the two cups on this one. Um, so, uh, this, these measuring cups here, I highly recommend them. Uh, we ordered them from an actual baking company. Uh, the measuring lines are actually molded into the plastic, whereas the measurement lines on this one are just painted on with paint. The ones that are painted on with paint uh, sometimes the paint does not get on straight on the measuring cup or on the same spot in the measuring cup. Whereas the ones that are molded into the plastic, it's going to be the exact same every time, pretty much. I mean, maybe not to the exact half a gram or something, but within a really close amount. Um, and so we find when we want to do liquid measurements and we need accuracy with our liquid measurements, this is what we like to use. Um, our other favorite, and guess what I use the glass one for? I use the glass one to melt coconut oil in the toaster oven. 
Um, it's actually fairly accurate. If, if it's something that you don't care if it's accurate or not, it'll give you an approximate guess. You know, it makes a great flower scoop or stuff like that. Um, but not if you're wanting an exact measurement. These type of measuring cups here tend to be a little bit more accurate, but even they have some discrepancy within themselves. I like to use this kind of measuring cups, uh, these little metal ones here. I like to use them for dry measuring. Uh, I like measuring flour, uh, dry ingredients, nuts, raisins, you know, those types of things. Uh, so these are my favorite dry measures. And um, like I said, you'll always have a little bit of discrepancy between measuring cups. We actually have four sets of these and one of the sets measures differently than the other three sets. So um, know that there's always going to be a little discrepancy there. Same with measuring spoons. Um, we have a set of measuring spoons. I really like these. Um, tablespoon, teaspoon, half teaspoon, what's the other one? Three quarters teaspoon. There's also a quarter teaspoon. Um, they're very nice measuring spoons. They measure fairly well. We bought another set, and look what the tablespoon looks like. And when we measured, can you see that well? Okay. When we measured a tablespoon in this one versus a tablespoon in this one, they're not the same. <laughs> it's like very little over. There's a very little difference. This one holds a little bit more than this one does. So um, what we like to do is basically take our tablespoons if you have more than one kind, kind of like compare them, you'll find some hold more than others. And the ones that are a little bit bigger, just don't go heaping on them. The ones that are a little smaller, make it a little rounder. So that way you actually get accuracy each time you make your own recipe. Um, so that's one thing to always keep in mind when you're making a recipe for the first time. If it doesn't turn out exactly like you may have thought it should, it could be because of the accuracy of the measuring cups of the person who made the recipe or the accuracy of the measuring cups that you own. Um, and so there's always going to be a little discrepancy with that. Um, but uh, there is one way to have an absolute foolproof recipe and that is instead of using measuring cups, you use a scale. And uh, you'll find if you go to our website, um, there is a there is a couple of recipes on our website that actually use a scale and no measuring cups at all. I have people ask me, and that, that is specifically, if you want to look it up, that's our gluten-free uh, millet bread. Um, our gluten-free millet bread is only in grams and not in measuring cups. And it's because it's the one recipe I have that is so sensitive in the amount of ing um, measuring your ingredients and how accurate you are that your recipe will not turn out unless you use grains. Uh, most of my other recipes, they have a little play to them. You know, like our muffin recipe, if you accidentally get a little bit too much liquid or a little bit too much flour, whatever, you can adjust. You can add more flour or you can add more liquid, um, whatever, it's easy to compensate. But with the gluten-free bread, you have one chance. And if it's wrong, there's not a lot of hope for you. So, uh, I like to use the scale for that. You can also use the scale to actually measure your measuring cups and see how accurate they are by putting one cup of water in each of your measuring cups and weighing it to see uh, if it holds the same amount. And you can get a pretty good estimate that way on which of your measuring cups are accurate. Daniel, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think you had you'd already said, said what I was going to say and that is what you're just saying if you if you put your measuring cup out and tear your scale you know that a pint is a pound right so you put a pint uh, a pound of water in there and if it comes up to your pint line or two, cup, or, line. Or two cup line or four cup line if you want, you want to do two pounds and the metric is the same way you know a hundred a hundred milliliters is going to be one kilogram or a thousand grams of water and, and so you, you measure that out and, and you can pretty well tell, calibrate your measuring cups that way uh, by, using, by using the water at the scale. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You know, these are some things in our kitchen that we don't really think about when we're making a recipe or wondering why a recipe isn't turning out right. Um, and so we want to just give you a few hints and tips. Of course, if you have been to
to our website, which I hope you have, uh, christinaskitchen.org, you will find a lot of our recipes are on it. And uh, we hope these hints and tips will help you uh, in making those recipes. So I want to move on to actually making a recipe. We've done with the setting up the kitchen process um, and how to prepare fruits and vegetables and all that. So uh, when you are wanting to make a recipe, let's say you've never made it before, you just found this recipe on the internet, and uh, you're like, well, I wonder how this recipe is going to turn out. Um, the first thing that I do when I look at a recipe, and I think, Daniel, do you have a slide for this? I like to look at a recipe, look at all the ingredients, and ask myself these questions. And I don't know what order he typed them out. Are they the same order that I wrote them in? Okay. So, uh, these are some of the questions I ask. And you don't have to ask these in order, but this will help you identify what's in your recipe. First of all, what is my liquid ingredients? Where, where is the liquid in this recipe? Uh, whether it be water, whether it be juice, whether it be milk, you know, what, whether it be uh, applesauce or uh, some kind of mashed fruit or whatever, what it, where is the liquid in this recipe? The next one I ask, um, well, it's not in order, but anyway, another one I ask is what is my flavor in the recipe? What is going to make this recipe taste good? If it's a sweet recipe, I look for flavor like you know, maybe vanilla flavor, or um, is there fresh fruit in it, or is there you know maybe like carrot chips or something sweet in it, um, or is there dried fruit, or you know what what is going to give this recipe flavor? Um, another one is what is my filler? That could be your dry ingredients, or it could be if you're making like an uh, entree of some sort, it could be like, you know, maybe uh, uh, potatoes, or it could be a grain, or it could be a, um, some kind of protein, or whatever your filler. What is the filler in the recipe? Um, if it's baked goods, it's definitely going to be your flour, your dry ingredients. Um, so you've got your filler, your liquid, and your flavor. Okay, so that's what's going to. That's the bulk of your recipe and what it tastes like. The next thing is, how is this thing going to hold together? So what is my binder? What is the binder in this recipe? Um, what is going to hold it together so when I take it out, it isn't going to fall apart to pieces or turn to mush? Um, next one is, what is my oil? Or that could translate as, what is the fat? Because some recipes don't have oil, but they might have nuts. Um, or maybe they have olives or uh, maybe avocado or there's usually a recipe has some kind of fat content in it of some sort. Um, next one is, what is my sugar? Or you could say, what is my sweetener? Because it doesn't have to be actual sugar to sweeten, right? It might be dates, it might be um, honey, it might be sorghum molasses, it might be maple syrup, it might be, you know, there's so many things that we can use like for sweetener. But what is the sweetener in this particular recipe? And then lastly, what is the leaven? What is going to make this fluffy? Um, in the normal uh, recipes, like not vegetarian ones, you'll find egg is a leavening. Um, or it might be baking powder, it might be yeast. Um, but what is what is going to make this light and fluffy? Um, and obviously if you're baking, <laughs> you hope that there's some kind of leaven in there or it's going to be flat, right? Um, but uh, there are hidden ingredients that are leavening. Like even um, Soy is a natural leaven, so even uh, soy milk helps with the leavening process in some way. Um, there's many different types, but to identify what it is. So if you're looking at your recipe and you've identified what all those things are, it helps you analyze, is this recipe going to taste good? Is it going to turn out? Maybe you're looking through the recipe. Um, and of course, when I say, what is my flavor, you hope there's salt in it. Right? <laughs> um, or at least something salty. Maybe it's, uh, you know, um, uh, it just left me now. Uh, what was I going to say? Like a soy sauce. Soy sauce, soy sauce is a natural salt. Um, anything soybean is actually a natural salt. Celery is a natural salt. Um, some of those things as well. But anyway, it can help you know if it's going to taste good, if it's going to turn out, if it's going to raise. 
It's going to be a flop just by analyzing. And you can actually identify if a recipe forgot something. Sometimes recipes get published, and I can even say the same with my website. You might find a recipe on my website and say, wait a second, she forgot an ingredient. You won't know it unless you ask these questions. Um, these questions will also help you if you want to improvise a recipe. Let's say, oh, this recipe calls for applesauce. I don't have any applesauce. I'm just going to leave it out. Well, you need to analyze that recipe first. Is that applesauce the sweetener? Is that applesauce the oil? What is that applesauce in there for? And then you'll know what you should replace it with. Uh, and uh, that'll help you know whether you should leave it out or not. <laughs> Um, or what, what to replace it with. If it's just a sweetener, you can replace it with sugar or honey or maple syrup or you know something like that. But if it's your egg, well, you're going to want to replace it with something that's an egg replacer. If it's your oil, then you're going to want to replace it with something like oil or something else that's going to help compensate for that. So those are things you want to keep in mind. Um, you can go off that slide now. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, and that is... Uh, you also have to realize your wet and dry ratio. Okay, so each recipe has a certain amount of dry and a certain amount of wet. And if you want to replace a dry recipe, let's say you want to replace dry sugar with maple syrup, which is wet. Guess what? Maple syrup is 40% water. Okay, so if you're going to replace your dry sugar with maple syrup that's 40% water, you're going to want to decrease your liquid ingredients by a little bit to compensate for the fact that you're adding more liquid to your recipe. Um, so same with uh, honey and sorghum molasses, they're also 40% water. So that's kind of a, a ratio you're going to deal with any time you replace sugar with a wet sugar. Uh, but I want to talk about a few more substitutions because I think uh, substitutions is really important. There's a lot of times that we say, oh, I have everything in this recipe except one ingredient. What can I substitute it with? Or maybe uh, you're wanting to do, let's say you're wanting to do a recipe uh, to replace a recipe that has like egg in it or maybe milk. Maybe you're wanting to go plant-based and you have this family recipe that you want to uh, change and substitute to be a really nice uh, recipe that your family will still enjoy. Um, how do you know what to substitute for? So the first one I want to talk about is egg. How do you substitute egg? I have seen charts, and you probably found them, you can find them anywhere on the internet, that says for one egg you can use, and it's got like one tablespoon of cornstarch, or one tablespoon of flax seed, or, or so much uh, uh, chia seed, or so much tofu, or you know, there, there's like a whole list of all these things, right? But the problem is that each of those are used in different situations. Like, for instance, if you wanted scrambled eggs and you decided to use flaxseed instead of egg, and so you made scrambled flaxseed. Well, if any of you work with flaxseed, you know that would taste absolutely horrible, right? <laughs> You'd have this, you know, this gluey, gummy, nasty mess. Um, and so, like not each thing is good for every situation. Same with cornstarch. Um, well, obviously cornstarch is not gonna make scrambled eggs. Um, but uh, corn, uh, tofu like is also listed as an egg replacer, right? Tofu makes great scrambled tofu, which is just like a scrambled egg. But if you want some kind of egg liquid to dip something in before you bread it and fry it, you can't dip it in tofu, right? It's not gonna work. But cornstarch mixed with water is perfect for dipping in, breading, and then uh, frying or grilling um, if you want that nice crispy outside texture. So knowing what each of these are for is very helpful, and I just want to talk about some of them. It's not a question, but yes, uh, Dana Lott said, I see your sweet mama in the kitchen, and told her hi. <laughs> hi, Mom. You've been spotted. Pan, pan over there, man. You see? Wave, wave at our audience, Mom. <laughs> I knew you'd see her if you watched long enough. <laughs> she's definitely here, and she's been working hard. She's just now sitting down. Okay, so cornstarch and water. 
Um, that is, like I said, uh, my favorite one to use for breading. Um, if you want to dip it in and then dip it in your breading or flour um, or breadcrumbs or whatever. And then uh, I don't fry it when I do that. I actually toast it in a ceramic skillet um, or bake it in the oven and it works great. It tastes like it's fried or you can put it in the air fryer. Uh, any of those options work really well with that, without the oil, uh, which is great. But um, another one, of course, is applesauce. Now at home, we like to make our own applesauce, and so at home, that's what I'll use. I'll just open a jar of applesauce and put it in. Applesauce is great to replace eggs in baking, um, but when I do, I don't do just applesauce. I will add something else to it, like flaxseed and chia seeds, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, but flaxseed, excuse me, applesauce is really good. But you don't always have home canned applesauce or store-bought applesauce on hand. What do you do then? Uh, when we don't have applesauce around, which is here at the restaurant, uh, we take an apple, we cut it and core it and chop it into pieces, we throw it in the blender, and we blend it up. And we have raw applesauce. And we put that in. And we use that in um, our muffins, um, especially like our cranberry muffins you can find the recipe on our website. Um, the cranberry muffins use apple and that is actually part of the egg um, because it helps to bind it and it also helps to keep it moist um, for a, a great tasty muffin. It also adds to the sweetener so you don't have to put as much sugar in and of course it also helps um, moist, keep it moist so you don't have to use as much oil which is great. Um, next one is Flaxseed and chia seed. And I'm sure many of you have heard uh, that flaxseed and chia seed, can you see these? I don't know how well you can see them. Uh, maybe Macy, you can put them there. Can you see them there? Yep. So this is flaxseed. This is actually golden flaxseed. Um, and this is chia seed. This is a black chia seed. There's also a white chia seed. Uh, if I'm baking with something that's a lighter color, uh, then I use the white chia seed instead of the black. Um, but either one worked well. Uh, these are both amazing egg substitutes. Uh, they have a lot more of the binder and they also help with keeping it moist. Uh, one of the things uh, I have discovered is some secrets on how to uh, make them easier to use. So uh, one of the things, and I think it's one I failed to mention, where did it go? I had a, what's that? My grinder. Where'd it go? It was positive. It was here. Ah, oh, yeah, it's been found. Thank you, Macy. She has eagle eyes. You need to grind it. Now, uh, this is a coffee grinder, uh, also known as a coffee and seed mill. Uh, it works very well because you can put like a tablespoon or two of seeds in there, uh, put the lid on, plug it in, and it grinds it up nice and smooth. Uh, but uh, when I first started with excuse me, with egg-free baking, um, the first thing I started using was just flaxseed as an egg replacer. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of years later, or a few years later, <laughs> that I learned about chia seeds. And uh, one day, I did not have enough flaxseed uh, for my recipe. I was like, well, I'll do half flaxseed and half chia, because I had heard that chia seed was also a good egg replacer. And wouldn't you know, I was making cookies that day. The cookies turned out the best that they'd ever turned out. The same cookie recipe that I've been making for years. It's like totally rose, it was nice and fluffy, uh, had amazing texture. And I was like, wait a second, I think I stumbled on something. Flaxseed and chia seed together works better than just plain flaxseed. And so I started doing that in all of my baking recipes. So you'll notice in our muffins and in our cookies, uh, we have half flaxseed, half chia seed. Uh, I also noticed that when you grind them, when you grind the chia seed, it tends to clump. But when you grind chia and flax together, it doesn't clump near as bad. So I just put my flaxseed and chia seed together in the grinder and grind it together. Um, and then it's all ground and ready. If you don't have a grinder, it's okay. You can buy ground flaxseed very easily. They sell it in most supermarkets. All health food stores can get it. Um, and same with ground chia seed. 
you can get that quite easily as well. Um, it comes in little bags and you just put it in the fridge, just use it as you need it. Um, you, there are also some companies that make flax seed and chia seed mix, where it's mixed half and half in the bag, and then you just scoop it out, you've already got it mixed together. So however it comes, you can use it. Um, but the early days of using flax seed and chia seed as an egg replacer, um, they would tell us, take the flax seed, grind it up, put it in a bowl, mix it with water, let it sit for like five to 10 minutes until it turns all jelly-like, like an egg, and then beat it into your recipe. And let me tell you, that's a lot of work, especially when you're making a big batch of muffins. Um, you've got your wet ingredients in there and you're trying to beat this, this jelly-like flax seed into your recipe. <laughs> and it gives your arm a workout. And so finally one day I said, flee with this, um, we're just going to put the flax seed and chia seed directly in the dry ingredients, mix it up, and then let the whole thing sit. And what do you know? It works. And you don't have to sit there beating this, this jelly flax seed into your recipe. And it saves so much time work. So anytime now I see flax seed and water as a separate uh, egg in any recipe, I say, no. <laughs> and I just put the dry ingredients in with the flax and chia. And then when, once it's mixed, just make sure you let the whole mix set aside for five to 10 minutes for that flax seed to activate and get all jelly-like in the whole recipe. Um, I do that for muffins, cookies, uh, and most recently I've been doing it for pancakes and it works amazing. Uh, for waffles, you don't have to worry about it all because with waffles, you just uh, put everything in the blender, flax seed and all and blend it all up and it, it activates itself. So, uh, flax seed and chia seed work great as egg replacers in all of your baking stuff. Like I said, uh, your muffins, your cookies, uh, waffles, pancakes, um, any of those type of things. They are, it is amazing. Um, and in some things, in some of my recipes, I use just that. That's my only egg replacer. Um, in our muffins, we add either applesauce or mashed bananas or pumpkin, uh, canned pumpkin, um, or cooked pumpkin, or sweet potatoes, any of those um, is actually part of your egg replacer in the recipe. Um, so for our pumpkin muffins, of course we use canned pumpkin. Uh, for our blueberry muffins and our double chocolate muffins, we use mashed banana. And for our cranberry muffins and carrot raisin muffins, we use blended applesauce. And that is, that's part of our egg. Uh, which helps with the moisture and binder and actually helps make it fluffy. Let's see, what else? Flax gel, do we have any flax gel? I wanna talk about flax gel. My mom and I do not make it very often, but we made it today just so you could see it. If it's not done cooling, I can save it for later. What's that? If it's not done cooling, I can save it for later. Yeah, it's it's cool. it's too hot, okay, we'll save it for the end. Remind me, okay? Not to forget the flax dough. Um, so I will talk about that in a minute. Another one that is an egg replacer is called aquafaba. That's kind of a weird name, but uh, aqua of course means water, and faba means bean, and I'm not sure what language. But aquafaba is water off the beans, okay? So, um, if you take a can of like, say, garbanzo beans or chickpeas, um, you can use northern beans, whatever, the most popular is the garbanzo beans. You wanna make sure it's garbanzo beans that do not have salt. At least you'll have salty water um, or salty egg. <laughs> but you take the liquid and you drain it off and you put it in a food processor or put it in a bowl with an electric beater and you beat it like you would eggs and it turns into white, fluffy, it looks like meringue, okay? Um, literally like egg meringue, that's what it looks like. And you can uh, add powdered sugar to it and scoop it on a cookie sheet and make meringue cookies out of it. Uh, you can scoop it on top of a pie and brown it just like meringue. Um, or you can add powdered sugar to it and make it into whipped cream and stick it in the freezer. Um, aquafaba does melt, so you have to do something with it right away. You either have to bake it or freeze it. Um, if you just let it sit on the counter, it'll melt back to the same liquid that was in your can. Chicken. 
But um, that aquafaba can actually be used as an egg replacer in some of your recipes. And of course, especially for meringue. Right. What's that? It's Latin. The word. It's oh, Latin. it's Latin. Thank you. Lexi looked it up for us. Faba is mean and Latin. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's a fun one to play around with. I have not done it much, um, but uh, it is an option for an egg replacer. Another one, like I said, is tofu. Tofu, of course, makes the best scrambled tofu. <laughs> um, and if you want a recipe on how to make it, you can go to my website again, christinaskitchen.org. You'll find a scrambled tofu recipe. Um, it, I can't say it's identical to scrambled eggs, but it is very close. And if you like that really smelly, awful sulfur flavor mm -hmm. of eggs, and you want it in the tofu, uh, you can add a pinch of black salt, and that will actually add the sulfur flavor to your tofu. I don't, because I can't stand the flavor, um, but I think it tastes great without it. Um, but anyway, the other thing that tofu is good for as an egg replacer besides scrambled tofu uh, is if you're making a loaf or a casserole that calls for a lot of eggs. Like for instance, uh, we make a cornbread dressing in for, a, it's like a bread dressing, it's cornbread dressing. It's a southern uh, holiday dish around Thanksgiving and Christmas. The actual recipe, I found like a real cornbread dressing recipe, calls for four eggs. Now replacing four eggs with just flaxseed and chia seed in a little casserole dish that's a loaf would taste absolutely nasty. So what we did uh, was we took a block of tofu worth equaling about two eggs. And then we did one egg worth of flaxseed and one of chia seed. We threw it all in the blender with water and we blended it up into this white egg. That's what it looks like. We poured that in our recipe and baked it. And wouldn't you know, you cannot tell there's no egg in it. Um, it's incredible. So tofu is a great um, substitute for part of your eggs as a binder in uh, loaves and casseroles as well. Okay, right, we've got two more egg replacers. Um, one is mung beans. Anyone heard of mung beans before? Uh, mung beans is a bean from India, uh, known as, in India, it's mung dal. Dal is the Indian word for bean. Mung was the way they described it. Uh, and so when, when uh, the people from England in that area took over India, Britain I should say, not England, people of Britain took over, the British took over India, and they discovered these Mung Dal. And they thought, hey, this is a really neat bean. We want to take it back to our country. So they came brought it back to their country and they're like, what do we call it in English? And well, uh, doll is bean, and it's moon doll, so we'll just call it moon bean. And it's still moon bean to this day. <laughs> That's how it got its name. But uh, anyway, these are peeled and split moon beans. Moon beans are actually green on the outside. They have green skins. But you can buy them at Asian markets, peeled and split, or you can order them on Amazon or get them from us. And uh, when you soak them and blend them up, and pour out that batter onto a griddle, it looks like an omelet. Uh, uh, very incredible what it does. We make zucchini patties out of these. And if you go to our website, I think they're called mung bean patties. Uh, you can find the recipe for them. And they're literally like, you know, a thick omelet pancake, really. Um, we put shredded zucchini in, and onion, and some flavors. We put mushrooms in it. Um, and they're absolutely amazing. But mung beans can be used as an egg replacer in other recipes as well. Um, you can soak them and blend them up in the recipe. Um, it acts like a binder. Um, but there is a group of people who have capitalized on mung beans, and they have created a product called Just Egg. And this is what Just Egg is made out of. It is made out of mung beans. Um, uh, obviously, when you buy the just egg, you're getting a few preservatives and some oil and um, a few other ingredients added to it. It's not just mung beans. Also, it costs a little more than mung beans. I think one of these bottles costs about the same amount as a pound of mung beans. But uh, anyway, that is where the idea for just egg came from. Um, and just egg 
If it's the only thing you have access to, you don't have to have a blender to do it. And it does work as an egg replacer as well. Um, so those are a few egg replacers. Um, if I'm making quiche, um, I like to use tofu as my egg in the quiche. Um, there's other people I know who actually use just egg as their egg in the quiche, and it turns out great. It's just a little more expensive. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with these egg replacers. That was a long list. The great thing is that when this video is done, you can rewind it and watch it all over again if you didn't get that many notes the first time around. Um, I tried to cram a lot in. So if there's any questions, feel free to holler. Uh, that was a lot to cover in a short time. <laughs> but I hope that helps you in modifying some of your recipes that call for egg. Okay, another one I want to talk about briefly, and I've mentioned it some already, and that is how to substitute oil. Um, you will find there is oil in some of my recipes. Um, we have some background music. There's oil in some of my recipes on my website, but most of them can be easily left out or replaced. Um, almost all of them can be used, um, replaced with applesauce or blended apple um, or mashed banana or pumpkin. Um, all of those work as great oil substitutes. Uh, you just have to remember that they are sweet, so you'll probably want to cut down the sugar or whatever sweetener is in the recipe if you're using that instead of your oil. Uh, a lady named Beth said that uh, Just Egg, it was a new product to her, so thanks for introducing it. Oh, you're welcome. I should tell you where to find it. You can find it. Some Aldi's carry it. Uh, you can find it at Kroger, and um, some Walmarts carry it as well. Um, and it's usually in the egg section with the eggs. Um, uh, usually on a shelf, at least for sure in Kroger, that's where it's always at. Um, but it's refrigerated, so it should be near that section. And yeah, just egg, and you can make scrambled scrambled eggs with this as well, as well as omelets and a lot of other things as well. So you're welcome. Okay, oil. The other thing um, that usually has a lot of oil in it is salad dressing. And uh, so if you go to our website, you will find some oil-free salad dressing recipes. This one, I'm sorry, it's a small sample. I didn't want to ruin my whole jar. <laughs> This is our creamy herb dressing. It's made out of sunflower seeds and millet. Uh, we also have a Thousand Island dressing on there, um, as well as a, a Miracle mayonnaise that's made with millet and sunflower seeds. Um, you can also uh, make mayonnaise with cashews, tofu, um, but most of our mayonnaise, all of our salad dressing recipes, I think, except Italian, have no oil in them. Um, and even our Italian drizzle, you can, it calls for oil, you can leave the oil out, substitute with sunflower seeds and blend it up, and you will have a nice creamy Italian dressing as well that's oil free. So that's um, some ideas. And of course, if you don't want to make a salad dressing, just squeeze some lemon juice and uh, sprinkle some salt, onion powder, um, and uh, put some chopped nuts and maybe a couple chopped uh, slices of avocado on it or olives or something as flavor and you don't need a salad dressing. But I love salad dressing, so I made sure there's plenty of those on our website. Okay, the other thing is, um, I need that, Lexi, can you get that little ceramic skillet? Oh, yeah. um, when I am sauteing, if a recipe says to saute in oil, I like to do it oil-free. And so I either use a cast iron skillet that's been well seasoned, um, or I use a nice uh, stainless steel uh, frying pan, uh, or I use a ceramic uh, frying pan. And uh, I recently got this one since last month's cooking class, actually. Uh, and I absolutely love it. This is ceramic, it's 100% non stick. Uh, and the amazing thing about it, like you can even do sticky stuff like uh, just egg uh, or. Um, I think what other, I've done um, uh, eggplant parmesan and a few other things, and no oil at all is necessary. It does not stick. Uh, zucchini patties is another one you can do on it. Um, it's marvelous, um, and it's a great asset if you're trying to do oil-free or less oil cooking. And if you do need a moisture while you're sauteing, just put a tiny bit of hot water in. I don't use cold because you don't want to work the pot. But if you have a little bit of boiling water or really hot water, 
just a tiny sprinkle of hot water will help um, add moisture so that your vegetables don't stick. So that is a little bit on oil-free cooking. And if there's a specific recipe that I have on my website that calls for oil, feel, and you want to do it oil-free, feel free to um, holler at me and I can help you with that as well. Okay, other things that we like to substitute. A common one is buttermilk. Uh, buttermilk is one of those unique things that's, that we don't really think of like, how on earth would I substitute? I love to use buttermilk in like cornbread. Um, that's my favorite thing to use it in. I also use it in my pancakes. Um, I use it in my cakes and stuff like that. And so the way I make buttermilk, this is soy milk here. That's my favorite one to use for buttermilk. But if you are trying to do soy free, it's no problem. You can use almond milk or coconut milk. Just know they aren't going to curdle quite as much as soy will. Soy is your number one for buttermilk. But I'm just going to take um, my soy milk here, and this is just under a cup of soy milk. And I'm going to add a tablespoon of lemon juice. I'm going to move this flat so before I actually get water in it. So I'm going to put a tablespoon of lemon juice. You're going to want to come up close so you can see what happens here. Can you see it up nice and close, Daniel? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so here's our tablespoon of lemon juice. We're going to add it into the soy milk, and we're going to stir. Am I holding a spot where you can see? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want you to see how this is curdling. You see how it's curdling? This is our buttermilk. And you can use this in any recipe that calls for buttermilk. Like I said, I use it for, for uh, pancakes um, and cornbread and cakes especially, when I want that buttermilk curdled um, texture. Almond milk and uh, coconut milk don't curdle quite as much, but they do curdle a little bit as well. And uh, they will work fine if you're trying to do soy free. So there's our buttermilk. Um, what else? Cheese. Cheese is one of those big ones that's hard to replace. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about all of the store-bought cheese out there because there's a huge debate as to which vegan cheese tastes better and I'm not going to join the debate because frankly all of them are not the greatest for you. They're all processed and you want to use them all very sparingly. Um, it's nice for a once in a while treat. But if you're wanting a cheese that is healthy, um, and guilt-free, we make a cheese sauce. Um, and you can see how, I don't know if you can see it or not. You have to bring it up. I'm, I'm putting Macy to work now. Look at this cheese sauce, this melty cheese. Isn't that amazing? Um, it smells like cheese. Uh, it tastes, not exactly, but very close. Um, and this recipe is on our website. It's called Melty Cheese. Uh, and it is made out of cashews and brown rice. And we get the color from pimentos, um, or if you don't have pimento, you can use red bell pepper. Um, and uh, some nutritional yeast is an optional ingredient, which adds a little bit more of a cheesy flavor. Um, and uh, it's amazing. You can use it pretty much anything that you would use a melted cheese or cheese sauce. So, um, let's see. What else do I want to substitute? Okay, white flour. White flour um, is something that I substitute. Now, a lot of people, you know, vegetarian, vegan, whatever, they use white flour, no problem. Personally, I try to do as much as whole foods as possible. So whether, uh, if it's um, whole wheat, I try to do 100% whole wheat flour. Uh, if it's rice, I try to use brown rice. Um, in a restaurant, you won't find anything white. We use only whole grains. Um, so if I find a recipe that calls for white flour, maybe it's a recipe that calls for like mostly whole wheat and a little bit of white. Um, if it does, then what I substitute the white flour with is either oat flour, I know this is a giant jar, this happens to be what we have. Um, oat flour is a great substitute for white flour. That's what we use instead of white flour in all of our muffins. Um, it adds a brand texture. Um, and the easiest way to make oat flour is throw oat, roll, I can't talk, 
throw rolled oats in your blender and blend them up, or if you have a food processor, you can go to the food processor, um, until they're smooth. And it'll be a little bit coarse. If you need fine white flour, you sift it. Um, if you don't need fine white flour, then you just use it as is. Um, in, our, in our oats, in our oats, in our, <laughs> don't die. In our muffins, we don't sift it at all. And that gives like a bran muffin texture. Um, when I'm making cake, then I sift it because I don't want bran cake. It's just not good to say. But uh, anyway, that is a very easy one to replace white flour with. Another one I use sometimes is whole wheat pastry flour instead of white flour. Um, that is also a very fine flour. Um, and that you have to get at a specialty store. It's not available at all your health food stores or, or um, uh, I mean, should say some health food stores carry it, but it's not available at your grocery stores. But whole wheat pastry flour. Um, and did I have anything else I wanted to substitute with? Oh, brown rice flour. That was the other one. Brown rice flour is one of my other favorites for sub uh, substituting white flour and works very well. Um, I'm not going to talk about gluten free baking today because that's a whole topic that could take another hour. But uh, my favorite flours, I'll just mention briefly, my favorite flours for gluten free baking is uh, brown rice flour, sorghum flour, uh, tapioca flour, almond flour, um, and gluten free oat flour if you can eat oats. Um, those are kind of my top favorite ones. Um, I also occasionally use coconut flour um, as well. But uh, let's see. Sugar, that's the other one I wanted to talk about. Sugar is one of those things that it's in almost everything. And how do you substitute it? And how do you know? Well, we already talked about the wet and dry, right? Because honey, sorghum molasses, maple syrup, those are all great replacers. But they are a liquid, right? And so because they're a liquid, they are 40% water. Um, so that is a wet sugar. I don't have the maple syrup here, but it goes in that same category. For a dry sugar, you can use uh, coconut sugar. Um, that one is less refined. It comes from the sap of the coconut palm tree, and it's also a lower glycemic index. Or you can use date sugar, which of course is dried dates, uh, ground up. It has a lower glycemic index, and of course is very little processed. Um, those are all amazing uh, sugar replacements. And then if you're wanting something less sweet than that, then once again, you go back to your applesauce, uh, mashed bananas, um, chopped dates, raisins. Those things are also very much um, healthy forms of sugar. Everything is sugar, okay? This is all still sugar. It's still gonna react in your bloodstream as sugar, so you still gotta be careful. It's not like you can dump bucket pulls on anything. But uh, it is a little bit less processed has a little bit more, especially like the date sugar still has the fiber in it, uh, and uh, it's not going to escalate your blood sugar quite as much, uh, but you still need to use it in moderation. Okay, the other thing that you can use as sugar is fruit juice. Uh, I use uh, uh, frozen fruit juice concentrate instead of sugar in some of our recipes, like that's what we use in our cheesecake, or we also use dried fruit. Um, like dried pineapple. Uh, dried pineapple is a great uh, resource for natural sweetener as well. Um, just this week we made, a, or I should say last week, last week we made strawberry jam with uh, strawberries and dried pineapple. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, no sugar in it. So that takes care of sugar. I think I'm getting toward the end of it. And what do you know, it's seven o'clock. That hour flew by really fast. <laughs> Did uh, anyone send any more questions in? Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed your crash course in uh, healthy baking and healthy cooking and setting up your kitchen. Um, I had a lot of fun preparing this for you. And hey, if you have questions, you can always shoot me an email or a Facebook message or give us a call. Um, our contact information is on our Facebook page as well as on our website, ChristinasKitchen.org. Uh, feel free to look us up and uh, stay tuned for next month's cooking class. It'll be on the third Tuesday of next month is July, right? <laughs> third Tuesday of July 
at 6 p.m. Um, Daniel, will you come and have a closing prayer for us? Excellent class. Let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the good time that we've had this evening. Thank you for the things that we have learned. I pray that you will uh, be with each one who is listening today or who will, will be listening to the recording in the, in the coming days. Uh, I pray that you will bless each one during this time when we have to stay apart because of the coronavirus. And uh, Lord, I pray that we may meet together again soon. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us. We we'll hope to see you next month. God bless and have fun cooking. Amen.